Great. Well, thank you. My name is uh, Katie Dykes. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Energy at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And I'm just really grateful to the uh, Yale Climate and Energy Institute and to Senator Murphy for convening us today. And, and especially impressed by all of you for, for turning out. I, I am a recovering uh, longtime Yale student. And uh, <laughs> It wasn't that long ago, but I can't remember Friday classes ever being very popular, let alone voluntarily showing up on a Friday afternoon this late. Um, so I think it is a testament to the importance of this topic and, and appreciate um, the, the great turnout and support uh, for talking about this issue. You know, I'm really struck, uh, uh, it's, uh, hear, hearing some of the other, uh, some of the presentations and, and obviously the uh, emphasis on the need to have a much more resilient infrastructure if we're going to adapt um, to climate change. And I, I think that uh, my experience, I came to uh, work at DEEP, which is our acronym, uh, about a year and a half ago. And, and one of the things that has really struck me is that if we're going to have um, our uh, regulatory and policy planning uh, system encourage uh, and support a more resilient infrastructure, it has to start with the, the design of the, the government entity itself. And Connecticut has taken a really uh, important and innovative step in trying to make sure that climate change is integrated into all aspects of our policy and planning um, through the reorganization that occurred um, in July 2011 that created the department where I work. Essentially, uh, you took uh, to take the, the federal analog, the, it would have been the EPA, and you merged it with FERC and added a DOE on top and mushed it all together, and, and that's essentially uh, what what was created with our new department. We took the former Department of Environmental Protection uh, here in Connecticut, merged it with the Public Utilities Control Authority, and then uh, created a new policy, Energy Policy Bureau. And through this, this or, uh, reorganization, you know, what's happened is that now, um, instead of having separate silos where we think about environmental uh, policy and regulation over here, and then we uh, regulate utilities over here and think about energy issues, now we're challenged to do that all in one, uh, in one structure. Um, and it's very exciting, it's very, it's very challenging, um, but I think we're starting to see uh, some of the results of, of that, that new organization being reflected in the policies that we're developing here in the state. Governor Malloy has been uh, a, a real, uh, has championed a vision of cheaper and cleaner and more reliable energy for Connecticut uh, through a variety of different initiatives that we've been working on. My part of the uh, department focuses on the energy aspects and uh, climate change has been integral to, to all of that. Um, we have a very critical task here in adapting our, our energy system to um, to climate change, we're doubling down on our investment in energy efficiency uh, here in Connecticut, and uh, we are uh, engaged right now in procuring additional renewables um, to increase uh, the, the, the cleanliness of our uh, energy supply. Um, we have really been pursuing this on a whole range of fronts. Connecticut has been a leader in something that's called the, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, and we're very pleased to see now uh, the EPA uh, and, and leadership in Washington, including Senator Murphy, um, ensuring that other states are going to start taking steps um, to clean up the energy, uh, our, our electricity system, um, so that other states can catch up to what we've been doing here in New England and in Connecticut. Um, but as I said, uh, Governor Malloy's you know, vision is it, it's cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable, and each one of those uh, components is, is absolutely important. Um, it's no easy a task to accomplish this in Connecticut, where we have some of the highest electricity prices um, in the continental U.S., and it's no easy task in a state where we have uh, had to experience the, the, the major storms that have been um, detailed by some of the, 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 the panelists so far um, in 2011, 2012, uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, Tropical Storm Irene, the October snowstorm that knocked out power to uh, 800,000 of, of the 1.2 million customers of, of just one of our utility um, uh, companies here in the state. You know, I know Senator Murphy um, 
had uh, observed about, you know, we, we may not see uh, the, the fabric of dem democracy unraveling here in Connecticut as a result of, of drought or some of these other impacts, but if you cut off power and electricity to um, homes and businesses across the state uh, and people are without a shower and uh, a, a dead cell phone and, and, and sitting in the cold, it may not be long before you start having armed revolution. Um, so, and not to be light about it, but it, it, the, the economic impacts of storm outages um, are no joke. Uh, the, the, the safety uh, concerns, the impacts on public health are, are, are uh, very severe. And so for that reason, um, taking our, the, the governor's vision of cheaper, cleaner, more reliable, we've, we've sat down to say, you know, what can we do um, to ensure that our energy infrastructure is prepared for climate change? Um, and so we've been pursuing an aggressive, multifaceted strategy to improve the resiliency of our electric grid. Uh, through hardening transmission and distribution lines, um, undergrounding those lines where it's appropriate, uh, installing stronger poles, shifting to a smart grid so we can detect outages faster and in more precise locations, um, engaging in a, a, a vegetation management program, the right tree, right place, um, to ensure you know a lot of the power lines um, are brought down by limbs falling, and so making sure that we're minimizing those risks. But even if we achieve the, all of these resiliency gains with these approaches, there will still be outages. Um, hurricanes, blizzards, ice storms, they're going to take down uh, wires and poles and the lights are going to go out. The power may be up 99.7 percent of the time, uh, but when it goes out it's a tremendous inconvenience to the public and a threat to public safety and a detriment to commerce and to our economy. And so we uh, have, puzzled, have looked around um, to find out what, what kind of insurance policy can we uh, take out, what kind of system can we put in place to moderate the burdens when those outages occur. And we found one uh, in, in the form of microgrids. Uh, microgrids are a series of, of critical, they're basically tiny, tiny little electrical grids. Um, they're a series of critical facilities, uh, could be a gas station, a hospital, a school, a, a police station, um, that are linked together uh, by electric uh, uh, line, uh, trans uh, distribution lines and powered by a distributed generation system um, so that they can continue to provide power when the main grid goes down. So there's these complicated uh, uh, trips and transfers is what they're called that essentially flick a switch so that when the uh, when the grid um, uh, has an outage, um, that that's, that little micro uh, grid will island itself or isolate itself so it can continue providing power. Um, <coughs> last year, we had. Um, the legislature uh, gave a green light to a, a bond funding um, to support a very innovative microgrid uh, grant program. This is the first in the, in the nation to have, we are the first to have a statewide microgrid program, uh, which is very exciting and also a little lonely um, because we've been casting about to try to find uh, you know, answers to some of the fundamental questions about how to develop these. Um, there's some complex uh, technical and engineering uh, uh, challenges that need to be overcome. There's legal and regulatory uh, obstacles that have to be addressed, um, as well as how to fund them. Um, and th there are a lot of exciting examples of that out there. Um, the military actually has, has developed a lot of these. But what we've tried to do is adapt these microgrid systems so that they can um, support not just uh, public buildings, but also to, so that you can network together um, private buildings as well. Critical facilities um, includes your, your police and fire and uh, prisons, uh, sewage treatment plants, but it also can mean uh, putting together a, a senior center, um, uh, linking it with a, a gas station, a grocery store, so that they can stay up and running um, or could be a place to even just charge your cell phone um, while the grid is down. Uh, so it's been very exciting to see this program unfold. We uh, went out with a request for proposals. Uh, we got dozens of, of towns and businesses that responded. Um, this summer we announced uh, that we've selected nine uh, facilities to move forward. And then we're also, th later this year in this fall, going to be announcing another round um, so that we can get even more of these microgrids developed in Connecticut. Um, and just uh, one, one point to, to think about on this, you know, as I said, cheaper, cleaner, more reliable. Um, the microgrid solution is one that improves the reliability of our electric system, but we also wanted to achieve those other policy goals. And I think this is where it's so important to have, uh, to be thinking 
uh, in an integrated way about how to address the short-term impacts of climate change and also at the same time the long-term impacts and the long-term planning needed to uh, reduce uh, uh, carbon output that's contributing to climate change. So one of the criteria that we've included when we've uh, been developing these microgrids is uh, that these should be microgrids that are not just um, turning on when the, the power is down, but that they are able to provide a, a distributed generation uh, solution on a 24-7 basis, that they're powered by the cleanest generation sources possible, so that not only are they going to provide those benefits um, in the event, uh, of, unfortunately, of, of an electric outage, but they can also help to offset um, uh, and displace uh, fossil fuel generation um, that's running um, on a continuing basis. So it's a really exciting program. I just wanted to mention that just as one example um, of, of, one of one of the initiatives that we've been engaged in at, at the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, um, reflecting on our combined mission of energy and environment um, that's helping to uh, we're, uh, address uh, some of the impacts of, of climate change on our, on our electric system. So thank you so much. I look forward to the questions at the end. Thank you.